approaching Bloomberg Quaint. Whether it was last year's tension between the center and states on GST compensation cess, or the more recent recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission, in which the proportion of conditional grants to states has doubled. I'll give you just one illustration of the increasing tensions in the financial relationship between the center and the states. Now, in a recent op-ed, Yamni Ayer, the president and chief executive of the Center for Policy Research, has highlighted these challenges facing the future of fiscal federalism and even called for new mechanisms for institutionalized deliberation with states. She joins us today on Bloomberg Queen to discuss some of these thoughts. Yamini, thank you so much for your time. And let me start by asking you to list um, your key concerns for those of our viewers who may not have read your op-ed either in the Hindustan Times or your previous writings on this matter. This has been a fractious relationship for a long time now, and the tensions have only risen over the last several years. Absolutely. I think fundamentally, uh, the Indian constitution envisaged a fiscal, re fiscal federal relationship, which as many have described as centripetal or more uh, where the center had a greater powers than states in the sense that the center had greater revenue collection powers while the states had greater expenditure powers. And it was through mechanisms like the Finance Commission, specifically the Finance Commission rather, that the division of resources was to take place on the back of a set of formulae that would enable states to fulfill the expenditure responsibilities allocated to them by virtue of the constitution. What's happened consistently over decades, it's not a new phenomenon. What's happened consistently is that the central government, uh, fueled in no small measure by the dynamics of politics, have tended to overreach by taking on responsibility, expenditure responsibilities that were traditionally within the ambit of state governments through, in particular, a mechanism called centrally sponsored schemes and central sector schemes that sort of directed expenditure to states. Now, fundamentally on first principles, this undermines the core of fiscal federalism. There is a clear division of responsibility. There is a mechanism by which resources, revenue is to be divided between the center and states. And on the basis of what states are closer to the ground, there's also the third tier of governance that we don't talk about enough, the local governments even closer to the ground. Therefore, on first principles alone, best capable of identifying needs and priorities, therefore best effective at spending. But politics means that the center wants to take responsibility and take credit and therefore have consistently uh, overridden this core constitutional principle to spend in the name of uh, on, on matters that are traditionally in the name of states. That's the first long term challenge. And states have complained about this consistently from the 1960s onward. If you look at Government of India reports addressing this challenge of center state relations, you see for, for, for decades now, states have asked for more flexibility, more freedom. Uh, yet this trend has only exacerbated rather than resolved itself. In recent times, this has got even more complex by virtue of the fact that the Indian economy has become more sophisticated over time, there is now a pressing need for, uh, you know, creating national markets. Uh, and uh, the sort of GST is a great example. One nation, one tax makes logical economic sense, but it does create new types of tension in shaping the dynamic of fiscal federalism. In signing up to the GST, states certainly gave up a certain degree of autonomy and in giving up that autonomy, there are new tensions that we are seeing. And over time, these are only going to exaggerate because there is also now a national labor market and national goods and services are deeply integrated. So the dynamic of fiscal federalism is increasingly getting more complex. And with it, therefore, old tensions exaggerated and new tensions emerging. OK, let, let me try and look at some of these tensions in buckets. Of course, the most recent one uh, would be prompted by the 15th Finance Commission's recommendations. But before I even get to that, there are two other things that I want to bring to you. One is you spoke of GST. Um, and last year, we saw uh, you know, a considerable divide between the center and several states, more so states ruled by opposition parties, on the issue of GST compensation cess. Um, we're back in March now, uh, and, and the arrangement that was put in place eventually after much negotiation uh, will have to be reviewed 
either continued or adapted in some fashion for this one year. And then, of course, the test itself is going to be extended for more years than the earlier five to be able to collect the re revenue so that states can repay the center the loans that were borrowed from them. Now, how do you view this arrangement continuing? How do you view what the outcomes will be over time? How do you view the longevity of GST as it currently exists? Well, you know, just your question itself, I think, highlights the complexity of where we are. Uh, the uh, the the expectation uh, that states had when they signed up to the GST basis the compromise that was struck uh, in some senses was twofold. A, that uh, a din will arrive. The assumption was that the overall revenue generating capabilities or uh, consequence to the GST would be revenue enhancing and also revenue neutral. Uh, and the reality is that's not quite panned out. Uh, almost as soon as the GST was implemented, we have seen, and the complex nature of the GST itself has been part of the problem. GDP has uh, started slow, economic growth has slowing, slowed down, GDP has, has reduced, and the, the black swan event of the pandemic is only exaggerating this. The challenge with the GST compensation says actually is fundamentally now a a uh, challenge of a breakdown in center state trust. Over the course of the implementation of the GST, we have seen the center hold back, slow down on its, uh, even pre-pandemic, on the commitment of paying the cess. Payments have been delayed, payments have been slowed down. The fundamental challenge of renegotiating fiscal federal relations, which is the challenge that GST really threw up, uh, is to be able to generate trust. And in some senses, the GST Council was a very important first step in that direction. It created an institutional mechanism for deliberation that would build that trust and ensure that there was, although the center has veto powers, but there would still be cooperation between the center and states. As that trust has broken down because the center has not lived up to its responsibility, we are now in a very funny place because the core assumptions of a revenue on the basis of which the GST compromise was struck, frankly, do not exist today. And there is, in fact, an urgent need for the center and states to come together to renegotiate this. But because the center reneged and in the tensions of last summer, particularly July through September, when options were given to states, rather than taking on the responsibility of using its monetary and fiscal powers, of which the center has greater powers uh, constitutionally, to be able to fulfill its, uh, um, uh, its, its commitments to states, the center essentially pushed those commitments onto states in a way that the states really had no choice in accepting the options that were made available to it. That now leaves us in a difficult place where renegotiating a compromise against the backdrop of the new realities of today is going to be difficult. And it is really now for the center to take steps forward in re-enhancing and rebuilding trust. That means that the center, I think, is caught to some degree between a rock and a hard place. Uh, it does have to extend itself further than it perhaps can, given the constraints of uh, the pandemic as well and the fact that revenues are not going to reach pre-pandemic levels anytime soon. Uh, but it now, I think, has no option but to reach out further and try and at least be in a position where it supports states rather than further pushes the GST CES commitments through loans, etc., uh, for the long term. Uh, okay, only right. then can we talk about a renegotiation. That renegotiation is necessary, though. I, the reason why I brought up GST first was because it was the it is it is the largest loss of revenue independence for states, right? Absolutely. But we've seen subsequent actions by the center um, that have continued to sort of hammer away at this issue. For instance, let me go to the farm laws. I don't want to discuss the controversy around them, but what I do want to highlight here is if I understand them correctly, they take away the power from the states to levy any additional taxes or cesses in the non-APMC, non-yard areas. Now, this may be born out of one problem with regards to FCI purchases in Punjab, but it is now seems to be uh, you know, something that the center is pushing down uh, with states. Um, not to not to forget to mention uh, that many might argue that the center itself has legislated on an issue that lies <laughs> constitutionally with the states. So how do you look at some of these pieces coming together? 
So let's take a step back. Um, I think if you look at uh, the dynamic of center state fiscal relations over the last decade plus, you'll see a very interesting trend. The trend is the following. The center is increasingly shrinking by which I mean uh, expenditure as a percentage of GDP, uh, while states, in fact, had been expanding uh, in terms of expenditure as a percentage of GDP. Yet the political considerations that have pushed central government to continue to encroach on state subjects that I talked about at the start of this interview has remained strong through 2010 onward from which from when we've been seeing these changing trends all the way to the present and in fact I would argue in the present dynamic of politics even sharper right uh, so what has happened is that in some senses the center has increasingly been borrowing to continue its, its uh, financing its recurring expenditure and the nature of this recurring expenditure has has in fact been even more sharply in the direction of central schemes and centrally sponsored schemes ironically at a time when the 14th finance commission period was ongoing so the 14th Finance Commission, recognizing this long term trend of the center uh, uh, sort of uh, encroaching on states, had made an attempt at readdressing this by expanding the, uh, 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 the vertical devolution from 32 percent to 42 percent so that states had more access to untied money, money from the divisible pool that they could then allocate to their uh, uh, specific needs uh, and requirements. But in that same period, rather than these central schemes reducing, they've in fact enhanced because of the nature of our politics. So there is a political context in which you see a lot more centralization. And in one of the ways in which the center has uh, found the fiscal space to do this is through the imposition of cesses and surcharges, or rather the increase of cesses and surcharges that have increased. And the 515 Finance Commission has, in fact, noted this fact that they have increased from 2011 onwards and, in fact, are going to continue to increase. We saw it in this budget when the new uh, agri infra cess was also introduced, and ironically, at a time when these farm laws are reducing uh, state uh, access to. Uh, to taxation related to the Mondays, as you just described. Uh, so that's one part of the problem. The second part of the problem is, I think, has to do a lot with the with, with the challenge of economic reform that we confront today. The 1991 moment was in some senses about uh, capital market reforms, big financial sector reforms that was squarely within the central government's purview. Uh, the next generation of reforms, uh, factor market reforms that we confront, of which the agricultural laws are one example, are firmly state subjects. And there has been a general exhaustion uh, within the policy elites in particular with states ability to take the bull by its horns and be at the front end of this. And actually, I would argue that we've been unfair to states because these are deeply complex and extremely dynamic. And the very things that we thought were necessary conditions in 1991 have in fact transformed completely because the economic and social life has transformed as a consequence of the reforms of 1991. So different states are at different places of their structural transformation, therefore require a very different set of support for taking reforms to the next level. Yet we haven't addressed that fully. We've just got exhausted. And there is a general push for the central government to move things, which is the context in which legitimacy was built for the central government to do reforms on what are fundamentally state subjects. Uh, forget about the politics around it. It's just this, which is something that we do need to confront as we talk about federalism going forward. What is the role of states in economic reform and what is the role of the center? And how do the twain meet in ways that effect uh, enable the constitutional promise to be fulfilled, but also more practically allow for reforms to follow the unique pathways that different states' own growth paths are currently going through. You know, that would that should ideally bring me to my next point, which is the conditionalities that have been built in, in uh, you know, some of the recommendations of the 15th Finance Commission. But before I get there, you mentioned the budget and you mentioned the swap in the customs duty, right? Uh, where a new cess was imposed, but so as to not burden uh, consumers, it was, you know, customs duty was cut down. And effectively, what this means is that more money goes directly to the center's kitty and less has to be shared with the states 
whilst the finance minister sort of described it as no, I wanted money that was labeled towards a particular purpose. That, that argument doesn't wash. And in fact, some might even call this a somewhat sneaky move uh, to increase the piece of the pie that the center gets. Um, and that just that, that sort of underscores how this is worsening, isn't it? Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it's an interesting uh, tension that we are seeing consistently now. 14th Finance Commission and to its credit, the 15th Finance Commission have pursued the argument of enhanced vertical devolution. So if you look at the terms of reference that the 15th Finance Commission received, they were in fact uh, expected to relook at the 42 percent vertical devolution commitment that was made in the 14th Finance Commission and reconsider it in light of central government priorities to their credit they didn't they stuck to 41 percent right and that one percent was a uh, change was Jammu 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 Jammu. Yeah. so uh, the, the finance commissions have recognized and partly because they've been listening to states they go to states they have to re record what uh, what states are saying and states have consistently asked for enhanced devolution in fact states are saying 50 50 ironically prime minister modi as chief minister modi was saying 50 50 uh, yet politics requires uh, has mandated for the center uh, to be a lot more directing in its expenditure and by the way politically it's worked really well so if you look at voting data the interesting thing in uh, some of the lokniti surveys for the 2019 election uh, yeah. was that uh, in fact uh, many of the central schemes were directly attributable to the political party in power in delhi and in fact to the prime minister himself uh, you know so, so these schemes are important politically and and, and you know I, I do want to emphasize that uh, we always say that there's always a tension between good politics and good economics I think it's important to recognize that it's it, it is positive that uh, politics uh, that there is an incentive in politics to do more uh, in this way but it skews the way center state relations are being shaped particularly in the context of a single majority party at the center which also is you see a large number of states uh, having political and alignment between politics at the center and politics at the state and that's the fundamental political shift between what has been happening 2014 onwards versus what happened in the two in the coalition era that dominated 1991 onwards till 2014 so a lot of these tensions are getting sharper because of this transition in our politics uh, as well uh, and uh, and it is in this context that the center has used the instrument of cess and surcharge to really hold on to revenue uh, and this is deeply problematic i think uh, especially Especially against the backdrop of the GST, where states had signed up uh, to giving up on fiscal autonomy uh, on the assumption that there will be greater revenue and also better revenue sharing across center and states. This practice of cess and surcharges does add to the tensions in center state relations, making it harder for renegotiations to take place, which are going to be a necessary condition going forward. Yeah, and also counterproductive as the head of the 15th Finance Commission and Kissing himself said that if we're, you know, if finance commissions have increased the devolution uh, through cesses, you are taking away some of the benefit of that. Absolutely. And just, yeah, and just to bolster the point you've made, Yamini, let me give our viewers some data. I think this one is fairly well known that the collection from cesses and surcharge uh, has doubled from 10.4% of gross tax revenue uh, in 10, 10, 11 to now about 20%. Um, and also gross tax revenue itself as a proportion of GDP has shrunk from about 10.4% in about 2012-13 to 9.9%. So the piece of the pie is getting smaller and in that the center share is enlarging. Therefore, the amount of revenue that is being shared with states has decreased, even though two finance commissions now have stuck with that 41%. Let's come to the other issue around these finance commission uh, you know, sort of recommendations. And that have to do with the fact that so many of them are linked to conditions. And this comes back to the issue that you brought up, that the low hanging fruit of reform, especially centrally directed reform, has been exhausted. Now it's about getting the states to implement some of this reform, except that it's being done in what some might call a fairly heavy handed <coughs> manner. So I'll just give you one data point and I want your view on how you think this might proceed from here on. The proportion of grants that are now conditional on specified reforms being undertaken is about 57%, which is 17% in the 14th Finance Commission. So there is a huge degree of conditionality that's coming to grants. 
Some might say that's good. It forces states to move down the right reform paths. Others might say it takes away state independence that has already been eroded to this extent. Where do you stand? So when I first saw the terms of reference uh, three years ago, uh, I was very worried uh, because uh, the way in which the terms of reference themselves were framed, it almost looked like the divisible pool, which will shrink, uh, or rather the shareable uh, taxes will, will shrink. Uh, and uh, these conditional grants will increase significantly. Uh, the one sigh of relief for me was that we've stuck to 41%. That's a good thing. Uh, so the, defense, the defense fund is still ambiguous, right? The defense fund is still ambiguous, but I think that essentially, uh, there again, the worry was that the defense fund would essentially creep into the divisible pool. That's not happened. And I think that that, again, that's been a big step in the right direction. Okay. Um, in absolute terms, the, these conditional grants are not as high. There are two worries, though. One is, if you look at the action taken report from the government of India, uh, they clearly say that they will reflect on this and consider these conditionalities in the context of the centrally sponsored schemes and central sector schemes. So in some ways, now, you know, the two have come together, both the conditional, the conditionality based grants and the centrally sponsored schemes. I mean, we'll have to see how this all pans out practically over the next few years. But I think that coming, that combination suggests that uh, these central schemes are now in increasingly going to be tied to even further conditions. They were already quite, uh, they, they were linked to, to conditionalities. I think on principle, uh, I find conditionalities, uh, I think conditionalities are only going to complicate matters uh, simply because these again are state subjects and it is for states to be able to determine the best pathway for implementation, not for the center. Uh, but having said that, they reflect on these tensions of uh, what is the role of the central government in a federal, in a union of states uh, in terms of ensuring minimum standards of public services to all citizens. It's a sort of fundamental public finance 101 challenge. And our response to that challenge has always been imposed conditionalities rather than build on the enabling conditions that will ensure that all states are capable of delivering high quality public services to all citizens of India. By that, I mean, one of the big things we lost when the all centralizing, somewhat diff completely defunct planning commission disappeared. One of the things that we lost was the ability for particularly poorer states that were dependent on the planning commission for building plans uh, and strengthening their uh, and, and, and having predictability in funding over a period of time to be able to make up for what Vijay Kelkar has called the developmental imbalance. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that institutional structure anymore. So that fundamental enabling condition has disappeared, yet you will impose conditions on states to perform in a certain way. It never works. In fact, what it's going to do, and in the 13th Finance Commission had performance grants for health, which when we looked at closely, we found that what it did is that it enhanced the ability of states that were closer to the performance outcomes that were identified to get more money, while those that hadn't quite met those uh, uh, that were further away and in fact needed more money to make, make up the gap lost out completely. So we, the focus has to be on enabling conditions, not on choking states through these conditions. And what inevitably happens with these conditions is eventually towards the end of the fiscal period, uh, when monies have to be spent, there'll be a sudden push of money. We saw this closely with the performance grants for the local rural local government under the 14th Finance Commission, which my colleagues tracked quite closely, where a number of performance based conditionalities were imposed on these panchayats. The enabling conditions simply did not exist. And as a consequence, panchayats never fulfill, fulfill those conditions. But there was money that needed to be spent towards the end of the 14th Finance Commission period. So suddenly the conditions were lifted and money was pushed, leading to inefficient, ineffective, poor quality expenditure uh, right at the end. So we know historically these conditions don't work. We should trust to a degree the democratic process at the state and local level to work itself out. Uh, there will be some mis-expenditure, but the conditionalities are not going to solve that problem. Can I then break up the problem in two parts? The fact that there are conditionalities 
is not necessarily all bad, right? For instance, I believe almost 60% of the conditionalities with regards to urban local bodies have to do with meeting certain water, sanitation, so water supply, sanitation, environmental pollution uh, requirements. There are other conditionalities that have to do with transparency of municipal finances. Um, these are good conditions. Uh, now, the question is, how do you implement these uh, and that's where it seems you're saying that the gaps lie most. The conditions in themselves are not bad as goals or targets for urban local bodies or rural bodies or even states to achieve at some point in time. The state's so, inability to achieve that now is a different question. So the center might, might very well in its defense say, look, we're doing our best to get states to reform because they've been very, very slow. That's been their argument with the farm laws as well, hasn't it? So how do you resolve this? How do you get the states to move faster in a more organized fashion than you have described? So I think there are two issues here. It is the role of the center uh, to set national standards, no doubt. Uh, the question is whether it is the role of the center to direct the pathway through which you can achieve that national standard, right? Because the conditions will vary state by state, Panchayat to panchayat, municipality to municipality. Um, and when you start, uh, when your starting point is imposing conditions on finances, as opposed to creating supported enabling conditions, you inevitably find yourself in a place where the conditions will never if be met and the goals will always be ineffective. In fact, the conditions will be used to undermine the capability of states and local governments to achieve their goals. So I would actually think about this much more by asking myself, by asking the question, what are the enabling conditions and how best can the center facilitate those enabling conditions? One part of those enabling conditions is to be able to create platforms for better center state deliberation, exchange of ideas, negotiation, and ensuring that uh, the, the, there is complete transparency and predictability in financing. That in some very small yet ineffective measure was possible with the Planning Commission, the National Development Council. Mm. Now that doesn't exist. So we do need to move towards building an institutional architecture that allows for this. And there I think uh, we haven't, need, the Finance Commission is not necessarily the place to do this, but as a policy structure, uh, this vacuum hasn't been recognized, isn't being debated, and answers are not being sought. Instead, we are trying to do what the Indian government has traditionally done very well, carrots and sticks. And never have these carrots and sticks worked well. Ultimately, for governments to function well, you need to have enabling conditions and an, and an accountability with your voters. Okay, um, I want to talk about the solution and, and the mechanisms that you've sort of you've you've suggested in your piece, but haven't deliber uh, sort of deliberated over in the piece itself. But before that, there are two other aspects that underscore this argument about the shift in balance of power and fiscal federalism, right? One is that, uh, you know, the center can, in a sense, forego any kind of tax revenues that it wants. But if I understand correctly, in the 15th Finance Commission and maybe also in the 14th Finance Commission, uh, some of the devolution to states is linked to their tax performance. Uh, so, I, you know, I just want to sort of underscore or highlight, uh, you know, the some, some might call it uh, double standards there. And the same applies to borrowings, right? The center would have pushed out its fiscal deficit targets over a long period of time, um, but states don't necessarily have that kind of latitude. Uh, all of this heightening the tensions between the two. Absolutely, and don't forget the local governments too that are uh, that, that are part of exactly the same conundrum. I think that you know it's also important to to since the finance commission as well located itself in the context of COVID uh, to highlight another aspect of this tension that that that, that you've pointed to. Uh, once the COVID crisis hit, states are at the front line. Uh, health is a state subject. Uh, importantly, uh, all social protection measures, uh, everything was sort of basically located at the state level and states do not have the monetary and fiscal powers that the center does to be able to to be able to respond rather than supporting states 
what the center did essentially was to centralize the sort of COVID economic response, mm -hmm. uh, relying, choosing on its own to rely on monetary levers to infuse liquidity and ignoring the demand from states to support their balance sheets that were in dire straits. And we'll only get a full view of how bad things are at the state level once all the state budgets come. Uh, and instead, uh, leaving states by increasing the borrowing limit, leaving states to the markets uh, to make up for the gap. Whereas, in fact, this should have been the center's responsibility and states should have received grants instead. So uh, not only was this done uh, in terms of responding to the urgency of, uh, uh, of, of the COVID crisis and what it did to uh, overall revenues, it was also then done with GST, as we discussed a little while earlier. So the combination, it's states have not asked to be left to the market uh, uh, in the way in which they have. It was a center's choice. Uh, and yet the center is drawing on the Finance Commission's uh, sort of uh, fiscal deficit, uh, uh, fiscal disciplining uh, uh, glide paths to say that it is for states to, to discipline themselves faster than the center has give it, given itself a lot more leeway. What this is going to do to state finances in the long term, which had in fact been cleaning their act up until uh, Uday, the Uday scheme uh, was launched. Uh, and even and if you remove Uday, the implications of Uday on the state finances, overall, states have been doing relatively better. They have kept their revenue deficits in check. They have kept their fiscal deficits in check. It is shifts at the center that was beginning to impact states. And now that impact is going to be even more significant. Yet the demand for discipline is much stronger on states than the demand for discipline on the center. The impact this is going to have, particularly on core expenditure functions of states, is significant significant and one that we shouldn't uh, disregard. States basically are responsible for wages and liabilities. So all the hiring of, uh, you know, frontline workers in particular uh, is all really at the state level. Uh, when you start imposing fiscal discipline, requ disciplinary requirements, a lot of this is, is, is either going to lead to understaffing. We are already very understaffed at the front lines or contract staff, which have which is already the case, actually, which creates its own vacuum of implementation capability at the uh, grassroots level. Uh, that has a direct impact on the quality of service delivery. That has a direct impact on the ability of states to make conditionalities. And so the vicious cycle continues. So the impacts of fiscal disciplining on states is something quite significant because it affects the quality of service delivery. I'm not at all arguing the states shouldn't discipline themselves. They should and they must. And they do have to be fiscal rules. But these need to be made keeping in account the what's and the house uh, and the dynamics of center state relations and the realities of the fiscal relationships between the two uh, in ways that are more enabling than constraining. Yavani, could someone argue that you're being very kind to states, that states have been very slow? For instance, we put so much pressure on the center to divest public sector businesses, uh, whereas no such pressure has been put on states to get out of loss making enterprises or to stop being in the business of business in some cases. Uh, you know, even with other various kinds of reform, if I can use that word loosely, uh, states, like you said, have been, some have been uh, moving fast, but many have been moving very slow. Is this the pill that is required to push them to move faster? States, are, uh, absolutely, states are no uh, uh, saints in, in and of themselves in two ways. A, uh, they do, uh, they are slow. They do look at their own conditions and their own political economy realities when they make choices. B, they make very bad decentralizers too. In fact, the Finance Commission vents its frustration as far as local governments are concerned on states when it says that state finance commissions have not been set up, they aren't uh, functioning well. And uh, thirdly, you know, I would, myself was quite surprised uh, after the 14th Finance Commission recommendations were implemented when state the very states that cried murder over the centrally sponsored schemes that were one size fit all, directing us to do things. The minute those uh, those were removed, states started asking for them back. So states do too play a very very complicated double game, and there's no question that states need to be moved or need to be egged in the right direction. That states also. Need 
need to be uh, the push for reform uh, needs to be accelerated uh, at the state level and then and, and that states do need to maintain fiscal discipline because minus that they wait for the center to bail them out no question the argument i'm making is on the how how do we do this do we do this by deepening control or do we do this by deepening accountability uh, of states uh, and I, I would err in the direction of the latter, not the former. The latter is slower. The latter is filled with uh, possible divergence because different states will behave in different ways. Uh, the latter requires a much deeper trust between center and state for the center to constructively impose tariff and strikes not destructively imposed characteristics. What happens today is that states blame the center, the center blames the states, and when all else fails, you can blame the local governments. That's exactly the accountability conundrum we need to get out of. Conditionalities don't help us. What could these mechanisms be? Because definitely a return to the planning commission can hardly be the solution. Uh, what could be the best ways to address this? Because the political approach isn't going to change. We have a majoritarian government now for, you know, uh, at least another four, four years, and who knows, um, you know, how much further. So there has to be some way to fix this. So I think that, in fact, when the Planning Commission was uh, uh, dismantled, uh, and there was a lot of public debate as well on what should replace it, uh, many people went back uh, to the old dusty libraries uh, and pulled out various uh, old government reports and rediscovered an institution that in fact exists uh, constitutionally uh, called the Interstate Council. Uh, it exists. It in fact even has a joint secretary or perhaps even an additional secretary if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, its fundamental role is important because it is a political body at one level, it is an interstate council. So all political chief ministers, heads of states, and the heads, heads of the union government uh, are meant to interact through the platform of this council. And it has a secretariat that can enable interaction and engagement uh, across the executives of center and state. Uh, and, and many argued that uh, rather than another planning commission, which was unconstituted, it wasn't in the constitution, that we should actually empower, enable, and strengthen the interstate council. I think the realities of today uh, should cause us pause and pursue this argument all over again. It, it, it's a council that exists. It is moribund, defunct. It needs to be re rejuvenated and renewed. And it needs to be renewed in the following way. E, we need these engagements at a political level so they are not ad hoc. What is happening today is you have a COVID crisis and the prime minister will on an ad hoc basis have uh, video conferences with state chief ministers. Now we need a vaccination plan. And there'll be an ad hoc set of, of video conferences. That's not going to work. We need an institutionalized deliberative mechanism which is regular, which is repeated, and which remains relevant to the uh, to the challenges of federalism that India experiences today. And within that, there can be special uh, councils like the GST potentially that are issue specific, that are sector specific, that allow the executive and the political uh, 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 class to interact with each, with each other, deliberate, and come up with collective solutions. One of the great things about uh, this combination is that the politics will always remain at the level of rhetoric and signaling, but it, it, it is for the bureaucrats to pick up on those signals and build the negotiations across each other. Uh, and the Interstate Council in its architecture at least enables that. Uh, so I think we have a uh, we have an answer, but we need to revive it and revitalize it to 21st century challenges. All right, Yamini, thank you so much for throwing so much light on an important issue that doesn't get discussed enough, uh, you know, given the exigencies of news. And thank you for sharing with us, uh, you know, a potential solution here. Um, I'm not sure, given the approach to the GST Council and the way things have evolved, you know, over last year, uh, that if the political will is to take away power from the states, even an interstate council can fix anything. But it's like you said, it might at least create a degree of dialogue um, that calms things down. It is absolutely. Uh, the, the politics will play itself out, but the institutional setting for dialogue and deliberation is necessary to be able to iron out the tensions of politics. 
uh, and ultimately uh, politics too has a way of working through its own tensions uh, so hopefully uh, uh, they ultimately both the center and the states need to work together i think they do recognize this but it needs to be done in an in a setting where at least fundamental trust can be built uh, even as the political signaling uh, plays itself out we yeah. started this well with the niti aayog the narrative of cooperative federalism states yes. as drivers of change perhaps a little bit of money where its mouth is will help move this uh, this along but the future of india rests in its states and it is the role of the center to be able to integrate this together uh, only then will we arrive at a sophisticated 21st century economy Thank you Yamini for joining us on Bloomberg Quint. Thank you.